It's so off script. Someone several year, weeks ago asked me, what makes you happy? And I heard my husband chuckle somewhere nearby. Happiness is not usually an adjective used with me. Um, but I protested. I said, no, I really think that I have felt happiness lately. I feel happiness sometimes when I'm with you. Especially, I think, when I'm at all school and I get to praise with you and I get to watch how you interact with each other. I feel like maybe in 60 years, I have felt that feeling of happiness. So I thank you. God has really blessed me by coming here. Thank you. I've been at Wheaton three and a half years. Some of you know me. You recognize what I look like. It's what you see on the screen. <laughs> a much fr younger friend of mine affectionately calls me her old white-haired woman. <laughs> because you and I have only been together a few years, I likely am static to you, physically, mentally, spiritually. You see me as I am now, five days after my 60th birthday. I am that person in applied health science that teaches that anatomy course that uses real cadavers. You might know me by my uh, limited skill set. I can cut a brain out of a skull with the cerebellum still attached. <laughs> I can wax eloquent on the liver. I can tell stories in lecture. I feel affirmed in that, though. Lecrae gave his approval of that last week in chapel. I know how to torture students with multiple response, multiple choice tests. I wish sometimes, though, that I had a video in my pocket of my whole life. I wish people could see who I was before God began his work of transforming me by the renewing of the mind. So I decided to show you a little portion of my video today. I pray that this testimony will speak to some of you, informing you of how powerful God really is to save and to transform. I hope it gives some of you hope for a family member or a friend, someone you love, who seems so far from belief and faith in God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When I was asked to speak today, the chaplain's office encouraged me to share a story from my own life's experience in which the grace of Christ had ministered to me in a meaningful, powerful, beyond coincidence sort of way. So I decided I need to take you back in time to when I was your age, and that is that first picture. I am 21 in this picture. I know, I've always been really photogenic. <laughs> This is probably after 10 to 12 hours of field work in the heat of the summer in Kansas. I am an untouched native tall grass prairie in the Flint Hills. I spent 36 of my uh, years of my life in this ecosystem. At this time, I was first and foremost a biologist. I spent my summer studying the natural history of Ruelia humilis, a plant, on an NSF uh, undergraduate grant. I discovered by staying up through the nights that this plant species was pollinated by the large white line sphinx hawk moth that only visited in the pre-dawn light. This moth flies like a hummingbird. It sounds like a hummingbird, but it has a proboscis that can extend up to 10 inches to siphon nectar from flowers that have long corollas like the flower you saw. I keyed at and cataloged a multitude of phylogenies of plants and learned the songs and habitats of bird species. By the way, do you know you're going to have a new bird watching club at Wheaton? <laughs> Go Thunderbirds! <laughs> I've heard President Riken sometimes goes out with the group to bag a bird a few. I do recommend bird watching. You never know what you will find when you immerse yourself in studying the natural world. You too may f find something interesting, or someone interesting. <laughs> we were married by a retired philosophy professor a year and a half later, under a windmill overlooking the prairie. <laughs> These events were part of my public life at the time. I was studying God's creation in depth, but did not see him. 
I had been raised irreligiously. I do not remember ever attending a religious service while growing up. I had missed funerals and weddings because my military family moved about every three years. There seemed to be no reverent experiences that might have evoked the presence of any God in my life. There were no friends or family that ever even mentioned God, so I observed no counter model to the life I was living. In college, I labeled myself an agnostic, and no one questioned me. In fact, I was affirmed in that stance and insulated from any alternative, since I was entrenched in a large division of biology in a large secular university, a place that can be a bastion of anti-Christianity. Additionally, my life was unfolding perfectly as planned. I was a child of the 60s and early 70s and fully participated in the excesses and sins of our culture and the times, but hadn't yet suffered any serious repercussions from a life of promiscuity and altered states. There were no catastrophes to give me pause or rein me in. I had just married. I had done very well in school and was on task for a career in academia. I was in control, thank you very much. God was not on my radar. A month after my prayer wedding and backpacking honeymoon, I began the first semester of my master's program. I would continue my education as a biologist for the next two years and get a master's degree in plant ecology. Bet some of my pre-med students didn't know that. That first semester of graduate school, I took an upper level course called Models in Biology. On the syllabus, it said we were going to learn how to mathematically model ecosystems. My professor was young, barely out of his postdoc. He was a new faculty member. He was strange, disheveled, skinny as a rail field ecologist, with unusually pale blue eyes that made him look like he was from another world. He was eccentric, but most field ecologists are. Sorry, Dr. Keel. <laughs> Unbeknownst to the six or seven graduate students in the course, Steve Fretwell had had a recent charismatic Christian conversion experience. And instead of teaching us how to mathematically model ecological systems, he felt called by God instead. The very first week of class, he brought up the word God in lecture. I remember he was shaking a little at the time. We graduate students in the class were dumbfounded. In the days that followed, our awkward silence would turn to hostile stares and passive-aggressive comments from some of us. What I know now, but I didn't know then, was that God was not willing to leave me alone in my arrogance and ignorance. Through this professor, he was willing to seek me in the least likely of places and circumstance. He had reached down into Acre 126 to touch me. C.S. Lewis has written, we can live expectantly that God is seeking us in both subtle and surprising ways. God had come to give me knowledge formed by personal connection and lived experience. He had come to where I was, and he was there to woo me with perfect words and perfect word pictures in language I could understand. You see, God gave Steve Fretwell probably the perfect words that only would have, uh, that would have gotten my attention. Steve said, if you are a real scientist, you will be devoted to seeking the truth, and you will seek the truth in all things. The idealist in me leaned forward. In my hubris, I thought, I am a real scientist. I just won the most promising student award in the division of biology. I am a real scientist. Steve continued, you must seek the truth about the reality of God. Search to know that the truth that God is, and then the clincher. Treat this statement, God is real, as if it were a hypothesis. As a scientist, you first generate a hypothesis you believe in. You then test the hypothesis by gathering data that will either affirm or refute your explanatory statement. Steve said, believe in God first and then let the evidence you gather guide you in modifying your hypothesis. But you must believe first. I'm not telling you that I came to faith by the scientific method, 
But God did use this language, the very best language for me at the time, to draw me to him. Thus began a month of me availing myself to believe there was a God, which was my hypothesis, and collect evidence. I began talking to God. I even fasted for days because I had read somewhere that pleased him. And I asked for evidence and signs. The Lord was slow to anger and abounded in steadfast love because he met me where I was and granted me much of what I asked for. One night, I lay in bed and listened to the wind roar and the trees crack and crash as they succumbed to an 80 mile an hour uh, a straight wind. I had spent hundreds of hours on the prairie adjacent to town, censusing native forbs on a 10 mile circuit through the ravines, tall grass, and upland exposures. I had many dozens of plants enclosed in cages made out of wedding veil material and quarter inch dowels to shield them from pollinators. I don't know what they look like to you, but they look like box kites to me. And I knew that they were very uh, aerodynamic. I was up all night despondent with the surety of what was happening to my work in the tornadic winds. Several times, I thought about my God hypothesis. The next morning, I drove to the gate of my research site, and in the distance, I saw something white. I walked up. The first hill, and there was my box kite, untouched. I was numb from surprise. Three hours later, I was completing the census circuit. I began to run down the last hill and yelled wildly into the wind. Te tears streamed down my face. I don't expect any of these events to convince any of you that a miracle had occurred in my life. What is important to me is that something in my heart changed that day. Yes, all of my box kites were intact. But more than that, I felt this tremendous revelation that comes from belief moving from head knowledge to heart knowledge. I was becoming a believer in God, an agnostic to brand new theist. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. A few short weeks after this incident, an old preacher from a tiny church in town stopped my husband in the locker room for uh, the, our workouts facility after playing volleyball, and in that old-fashioned, ineffectual, evangelistic way, asked my husband, do you know Jesus? After hearing no from my husband, he then asked, would you like to study? My husband's exact words were, no, but my wife might. She's into stuff like that now. <laughs> he showed up at the door of our stone farmhouse within the week. He was nervous, didn't really know what to say, so he handed me a New Testament, and he told me to read Matthew, a book about Jesus. He didn't believe I would actually read it, so he left and didn't come back. <laughs> After weeks, the Holy Spirit goaded him to return. When he showed up on my doorstep again, I blurted out when I opened the door, where have you been? I read Matthew weeks ago. And like the Ethiopian eunuch asking Philip, I said, what can, how can I understand this unless someone explains it to me? It was the first connection I had made between my newfound reality of God and his son as the means to him. It was the first time I had touched a Bible, even though I was in the middle of the Midwest, deep in the Bible belt. Within a month of reading more, I knew I needed to become a Christian. It was what God wanted. I called up that preacher and I told him, I want to become a Christian. I want to be baptized today. But the dear man thought I didn't know enough scripture to know what I was committing to. So he put me off by saying we would study more. The spirit was incessant in the hours that followed and I was compelled to call him again later on in the day. Harold had felt guilty putting me off and he was relieved when I called again. Late that afternoon, in the presence of a handful of people of, of, that were witnesses, I confessed my belief in Jesus as my Savior and was baptized in front of those present. I came up out of the water exhilarated. All I remember now, after o almost 40 years, is jumping on my bike and pedaling over two and a half miles home in the growing darkness. It was October 12th. 
and the evening air must have been well below 32 degrees because my long hair froze and stood out sideways in the direction the wind had blown it. I burst through the back door of our rented duplex and must have looked like a crazed person. My husband of one year was startled, then concerned, and asked, what happened to you? To which I replied, I have been baptized. What does that mean? <laughs> and, with re re and I replied without thinking, it means that Jesus is the most important thing in my life. I remember even now how his brow furrowed and his eyes narrowed in suspicion and hurt. It would take him another 10 months to come to belief and to put on Christ. Another story of a surprising and unexpected encounter with the living God. It was a radical change for both of us, but one we have not questioned or turned away from in these decades since. It is frankly unexplainable by any human understanding. Our family's reactions at best were suspicious and condescending, and at worst hostile. Not a single one of our old friends stuck with us. Do you have stories in your life where the grace of Christ has ministered to you in a meaningful, powerful, beyond coincidence sort of way? Look forward to more. We can live expectantly that God is seeking us in both subtle and surprising ways. Several years later, I was part of a neighborhood group of women who gathered infrequently to talk, make things like rugs and quilts, and let our children play together. A woman began coming that had stage four metastatic bone cancer. I found out quickly that Chris and I had eight-year-old daughters in the same class of the gray school down the street. The group began making a quilt that she could give to her daughter. We embroidered outlines of Emily's and Chris's hands into the corners of the quilt. One day she went into the hospital and I went to visit. She and I were only acquaintances, but I felt the spirit goad me on. I did not have to fumble for words. After polite greetings, I sat at the foot of the bed and Chris whispered, Dina, where do you think I will go? I looked up and above her head was a crucifix that the hospital had hung in the room. The light in the room seemed to change color and time stood still for at least an hour. Not a single person entered that room, which is not possible in a hospital. I took her bare feet in my hands and I rubbed them and talked. I really do not remember a single word that I said. As I reached into my bag, I pulled out this very Bible and I said, read Matthew. It is a story about Jesus. She called the next night and in a weak voice said, I may be starting to believe. She died the next day at the age of 36. I went to her memorial that weekend with my husband. Chris was married to one of her former English professors, a fiery man much older than she was and an ardent atheist. The ceremony was comprised of poetry and literature excerpts largely read by the same Dr. Hall. I was beside myself with anxiety and self-recrimination. Why had I waited so long to talk to her about the Lord? The memorial was short and ended abruptly. Dr. Hall paused, his face tightened, and he said, Chris asked for only one thing to be included in her memorial today. He sat down in silence, and the words and the melody of the song, the only thing that she had asked for, washed over me like a wave. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Thank you, Lord. Please pray with me. Thank you, Father, that you do work to fill us with knowledge formed by personal experiences with you. Thank you, my dear Lord, for saving me, for saving Chris, for saving us while we were yet sinners. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.